Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders, with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. I'm J.R. Lowry. This is Career Sessions Career Lessons brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit pathwise.io online and join today. Today, my guest is Greg Slover, who was my college roommate of two years and the best man at my wedding. He is currently a test pilot for NASA, where he pilots aircraft conducting a wide range of research. Prior to joining NASA, he was a lieutenant colonel and a pilot in the Air Force. In his years in the military, Greg flew tanker aircraft, led and instructed other pilots, performed operational leadership roles in aviation and program management, uh, and he also spent time as a test pilot. Yeah, his years in the military took him to Arizona, California, Maine, the United Kingdom, Oklahoma, Ohio, and many deployed na nations across Europe and the Middle East. Uh, Greg earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at Duke. He and his wife live in coastal Virginia and have a son in college. Greg, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure, JR. It's good to see you and good to be able to chat across the ocean with you. Yeah, I mean, we don't get to see each other all that often. We will this summer, but uh, it's been a while, I think, since the last time we were we were together. So um, good, to, good to catch up. Um, so let's start with what you're doing today. You're a NASA test pilot. Um, I would, which is pretty cool. Um, I would imagine most people hear that and think you're testing spacecraft or some sort of experimental aircraft, but your, your work's a bit different than that. So why don't you give the audience an overview? Yeah, being a NASA test pilot is different than being an astronaut. Uh, there is some confusion uh, at the beginning of conversations, especially if you're in a flight suit and it happens to match a color that they've seen an astronaut in in the past. So I do have to get past that conversation occasionally. So what a NASA test pilot, basically, if you think of NASA and the words National Aeronautics and Space Administration, um, I handle the testing of the aeronautics side of things, you know, the, the big A in NASA. Um, and so, uh, what we do is we take a, either an experimental vehicle or an experimental concept, and we try and do the testing needed to, to do what might be difficult for industry to do on their own, because the mm -hmm. government has a decent amount of resources they can put towards problems. Um, or it may be a, a research project that industry isn't even interested in yet, but that our own government researchers are interested in. And we'll, We'll modify an airplane to try and do that kind of thing. So uh, as a test pilot, I'll have to, A, make sure that the airplane is safe for us to go and do that research in, uh, because once we get the airplane to a safe point, the researchers like to be on the airplane uh, mm -hmm. doing their research. So there's usually a bunch of PhDs involved with any research project that I'm doing. Uh, they'll do the um, design of experiments and things like that. Uh, and then my job is to go out and use the airplane in whatever fashion they have thought about and try and get them the data they're interested in. If it's an aeronautics project, you know, we're looking at, you know, atmospheric and, and uh, airframe uh, changes and issues. Uh, it might be airspace things. It just might be how different airplanes and air traffic controllers interact with some possible new technologies that might be able to stuff more airplanes into the same amount of airspace as what uh, we currently do. Mm -hmm. um, and all with the interest of trying to keep the same level of safety we've always enjoyed um, in both from the airworthiness of the airplane and the safety of the airspace or the airfield. So that's mm -hmm. the aeronautics side of the research that we do. And then uh, NASA also, it doesn't show up in the title of NASA, but we do a lot of science uh, stuff. You know, that science might be uh, exploring a planet or a moon or, or, or a uh, outer space, but we also look inward and we do a lot of exploration of our own planet and we use airplanes to do that. So we've outfitted a bunch of airplanes within NASA with special instruments, um, special holes that look in all directions, special windows um, and the like, and, and 
So we'll do that to try and understand our atmosphere. It might be the surface of the Earth, uh, or it might be um, the upper atmosphere too. We do some imaging on sounding rockets that uh, deploy uh, equipment out in in not quite outer space, you know, but upper space, um, upper atmosphere, and then we learn about the atmosphere all the way down to the surface using our airplanes. So there's a lot of variety in what I do. Um, kind of shows that uh, path to variety versus going the route of the airlines like a lot of my peers did. Yeah. Um, and so that's kept me busy, challenged, and you know, it's it's just an enjoyable thing to be able to do. It, it, the the side of the flying being government service uh, makes it somewhat rewarding knowing that mm -hmm. I'm helping our you know our U.S. citizens in uh, you know learning what we want to learn about our planet. How many, how, how big is the fleet of test aircraft that NASA owns and how many test pilots like you do they have? Yeah, so NASA has six flying centers. Uh, those flying centers all have kind of a different mission. Okay. Um, you could, the, the big one that people think about might be Johnson Space Center and the flight operations they do there is centered mostly on astronaut training and preparation. So they have a fleet of T-38s, about 30 T-38s. Mm -hmm. But then most of the other airplanes that NASA has are kind of one of a kind type of, uh, of airplanes. And it spans from a small single engine piston airplane all the way through um, a 747 sized airplane. Um, and there, you know, there's just not a fleet common thing among them. They're all individually different. Uh, we have uh, a four engine jet airplane, a DC-8, we have a four engine propeller airplane, a, a Navy, ex-Navy P-3, and those are outfitted as airborne science labs. We have a couple of Gulf Streams, a uh, couple of Gulf Stream 3s and a Gulf Stream 5, and those we use for high altitude um, mm -hmm. platform research. Uh, then the next largest center is probably Armstrong Flight Research Center out in California, uh, mm -hmm. out at Edwards Air Force Base, um, and they have... Um, the type of test capability that you think of traditionally for uh, aeronautics flight tests. So they have um, some F-18 and F-15 fighter, ex-fighter airplanes that they use for high-speed research. Um, they have some Gulf Streams that they use for middle speed research, and they ha also have something like a T-34 um, turboprop and they have a, a motor glider uh, when they need to do some gliding type things. They, they use gliders to shut the motor off and then just be gliding through the air in order to take sound measurements at a particular altitude of maybe something that's flying overhead or underneath or something like that. So um, the type of airplanes we have spans uh, from really small and light to really large and fast. Um, and they do everything from you know using uh, infrared telescopes to look at, at the outer space to having uh, uh, LIDARs, which are essentially laser uh, laser detected and, and ranging. Um, they use LIDARs to remotely measure things like the atmosphere. And then we have, um, we can put pylons on an airplane uh, or probes on the fuselage of an airplane, and we can actually take in situ measurements of the atmosphere so that you can have the you know real-time composition of uh, the air that you're flying through. And uh, some of the other flying centers we have, uh, Kennedy Space Center has a helicopter operation, and they use that for range, um, range support with regards to rocket launches and uh, recovery type missions that uh, that they use. We have a small flight research center at Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, their center of research is basically icing research, so how it affects engines and airframes. Uh, that's most of their history is there. Uh, we have a small center at Wallops Flight Facility, which is out on the eastern shore of Virginia, and they do a lot of the airborne science work that I kind of talked about. Um, and then there's the center I'm assigned to, which is Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. And we have a, a small operation of about uh, five airplanes. Um, and we do a variety. We do kind of cross the realm of aeronautics flight test and the airborne science flight test. Okay. So, so many pilots overall, roughly? Uh, Pilot-wise, it seems like we probably have about 50 or, 50 or so NASA pilots. Across those six centers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, excluding the astronaut corps. Uh, you know, many of them are pilots as well, and they fly the airplanes, but they're not necessarily you know, hired on to do the uh, aeronautics and airborne science research. Right. So when you go up, what, what type of plane are you typically flying, or does it vary a lot? 
Uh, it can vary. Um, usually when I have a mission, I stick with the same airplane for a month at a time, and then I, uh, I'll, I'll stop that mission and move on to another one. But I'm currently qualified in uh, four airplanes. Okay. So I fly the single engine pistons we have, which is a, a Lance Air and a Cirrus SR-22. Um, we have a twin and twin turboprop uh, B-200 King Air. I'll fly that. Uh, we have a Gulfstream 3 and a Gulfstream 4. Currently, I'm only on the Gulfstream 3. We just retired a um, ex Coast Guard airplane, an HU-25, which is a um, a French Dassault Falcon 20 mm -hmm. um, that was militarized, and we converted it into a research platform. We just retired that, and I flew that. I also fly the uh, DC-8, which is out on the West Coast in California, and that is an airplane pretty similar to what I flew in the Air Force, so it's a, it's a good match there, but I have to travel out to go do that. Yeah. So that's not too often. So you know, it's, it's a bunch of airplanes that I have to fly and I have to basically relearn each one as each campaign begins because we just don't have the um, ability to go keep uh, regular currency like most pilots, pilots are familiar with. Yeah, from a time perspective or a budget perspective, you mean? Uh, both, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is a, it is a government budget, so it's not unlimited, and we have to be very conscious to spend the money wisely uh, as a taxpayer. I'm yeah. sure you appreciate that when, when we speak to that. And then time-wise, the airplanes themselves are either in a maintenance period, a modification period, or a research period. So mm -hmm. I only get to fly them during that research period, which is probably only a third of the time that the airplane has in the calendar year. Uh, some airplanes do well, um, and they don't break throughout the year, and they might get 50% of their time is research time. Mm -hmm. But in general, um, you first have to have a research project. It first, then it has to fit on an airplane, and then you have to have the airplane's availability, and then it gets kind of assigned, and you engineer the solution, and you go out, test it, and then do the research. Yeah. What are some of the more interesting places that you've gone while you've been doing this? Joining NASA, I've gotten to go to basically all four corners of the Earth, if, mm -hmm. if you believe in the flat Earth. I'll let all the listeners think on that for a little bit, a NASA person saying flat earth. Okay, it is round. I've seen it. But NASA has taken me to the South Pole and the North Pole. And so one of the most unique things I got to do is fly um, uh, a mission where we were uh, measuring the ice thickness uh, over Antarctica. And yeah, we would do yeah. this month, multiple years in a row and measure the same locations so we could see what the changes were year to year. And one of the things that we uh, got to do each time is... Um, is one of the profiles was to fly directly over the South Pole on the return leg, and uh, and that was always fun. You know, it, being right over the um, the South Pole, the navigation systems on your airplane don't behave correctly. They right. all kind of turn upside down and tumble, and and you have to then you know fly away from the South Pole for a little while and then resurrect them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat. The North Pole side of things, I never did get to overfly directly over the North Pole, but I get to go a couple hundred miles from it, which is uh, still pretty uh, intense when you're up there over the Arctic Ocean and you see nothing but sea ice, yeah. and it's uh, flat and white. And so that's kind of neat. And NASA's also taken me uh, you know, down to South America, over to Europe, uh, out west to uh, Asia and Korea. So I've been traveling as much with NASA as I did in my military career. So yeah. And and how often are you out and what are you doing when you're not out? We usually are able to keep our pilot participation to about three weeks if it's um, United States based, and then mm -hmm. we'll rotate in and out if it's longer than that. And if it's international, we'll probably go for maybe a month and mm -hmm. then rotate out. Uh, if it's if the deployment is inside of a month, then we'll just send one crew to go there and back. And then in between those missions is where all of our preparation comes. There's uh, uh, a lot of preparation that goes into these research flights because they're never the same place. Um, so you're coordinating with new air traffic controllers, uh, new airspace, new airfields, um, and all that coordination needs to occur up front and that can be months worth of effort just to get two weeks of data somewhere yeah. um, the the lead time required to get foreign permission to overfly their uh, their country uh, yeah. or do the research in their country uh, usually takes quite a quite a lead time it's supported if the country that you're doing research over is inviting you to do it uh, sometimes our scientists uh, want to do something that the 
nation that we're flying over has no interest in. So that mm -hmm. can be interesting to try and coordinate. Other times, the nation that we're flying over is interested in the same exact data and you have a good relationship and then they smooth the um, road to success basically by providing you an invitation to come to their country. So um, we have to figure out how to do that in either of those scenarios. How much connection is there between, you know, the part of NASA that you're in and, you know, what they're doing that's more traditionally what people know NASA for, the space piece? Not too much, yeah. surprisingly. Um, the uh, the space piece is very um, self sufficient. You know they get a lot of the attention, therefore a lot of the funding. Um, yeah. Johnson Space Center, who has airplanes that do science work as well as the astronaut support, they their community sees that and all that goes on. Uh, but I think from somebody looking outside into NASA, I don't think you would intuitively think about these airplanes and what they do, and you would learn about these missions if you're interested in you know, science and aeronautics and whatnot. We get a lot of coordination with universities. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, uh, we do a student airborne research project every year, uh, and it might be in one center or another, but uh, every year NASA tries to open up uh, our, our airborne research methodology and access to the airplanes to students. So students throughout the uh, United States get to uh, apply for this program and and some of them then turn into NASA researchers later on after they get their PhDs and whatnot. We have a couple at Langley Research Center who took that path. You know, they yeah. they they first saw NASA through a student research project. Yeah. And do you work a lot with like with the NOAA? Uh we have kind of parallel or a a good set of missions that that work well together, but usually we're not designing a research program in coordination with them. Okay. Um, we are, NOAA is very much interested in the atmosphere as much as NASA. So we have airplanes that are outfitted with similar equipment mm. and we are out there going and, and getting different things. But I think the thrust of NASA is more the scientific research and the thrust of NOAA is more of a tactical thing. You know, they're, um, they're interested in the current weather and protecting the, um, uh, you know, the nations against, um, uh, un climate, you know, they're, they're interested in making sure that we know what the, the weather is like, and they have to understand the atmosphere to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But the research that NASA does and the research that NOAA does both end up feeding the different weather models that we all rely on for day-to-day -day, uh, things like hurricane forecasts and just daily weather forecasts. So you were, before you were at, at NASA, you were a career Air Force officer. Um, you served a lot longer than I did. Um, so thanks for that. How long were you in the military overall? Um, so JR, I was in for 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, that was a wonderful 21 years. It spanned seven different assignments. Um, yep. About a third of that, the first third was operational flying in KC-135 refueling tankers. And th those assignments took me from uh, initial pilot training in Arizona through Maine, for my first assignment to England for my second assignment, and then to Oklahoma, where I instructed in the airplanes for my third. And that's where I got picked up to go to Air Force Test Pilot School. And from that point forward in my career, I stayed in the flight test environment, at least with Air Force Materiel Command. You might remember it as Air Force Systems Command. Right. But uh, I did that for two assignments at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, in between those two assignments, I did a program manager um, uh, assignment at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. That's so that was a three years of non flying and so you got uh, to see what I did. Recording, I did. I yeah. did. Uh, well, you were you were doing it on planes. I was doing it on satellites uh, when I was in the military. So, you know, when you and I met when we were both freshmen at Duke, I, you from then on you wanted to be a pilot. When when did you decide that that was what you wanted to do? Uh, so I had always been interested in being a pilot. I remember going to some career fairs in middle school and seeing the pilot career numbers, you know, what uh, what a pilot did, how much they earned. And I kind of ruled it out as something that I could ever do. It just seemed way too far uh, away from reality for a kid like that. Yeah. Um, so I had always been interested in anything that moves, you know, cars, planes, rockets. And uh, so I just figured I would be working in that in that uh, environment somehow. And that's what got me interested towards engineering. It wasn't yeah. until I got to uh, to Duke and 
in the engineering school and in ROTC that I actually saw some Air Force pilots come back and talk to our ROTC class. And mm -hmm. when I saw that they had done pretty much all the same things that I was at that time doing, going to a school, getting an engineering degree, going through ROTC, when I saw that they were just, that's the path they took, I was like, wait, maybe this is a path I can also take. So I started pursuing that and uh, uh, just applied. When I started ROTC, I didn't have a pilot slot. It was uh, during that process that I applied for a pilot slot. And when I was accepted to one, then it was just, uh, you know, full throttle from that point forward, trying to keep that momentum up and make sure I made it through all the different gates. How did you find your way into Air Force ROTC? What was your path for that? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting story. I was initially looking at the U.S. Naval Academy as okay. a place to go to for college. Um, I had my congressional nomination to the Naval Academy and was going through that process when I kind of had a little bit of a pause of if the Naval Academy came back and said yes and gave me a uh, admission, I would have felt some a large patriotic duty to just go there and do that. Yet I hadn't found myself in a position where I thought that that was right. So yeah. I, I stopped my application partway through because I felt if they came back and said yes, I would say yes in response to that and i might find myself somewhere where i i it, it wasn't a good fit so i kind of stopped that um i i knew that uh duke was an opportunity for me because i got accepted to there so i i decided that once i got to duke i would look into rotc so as you recall i came into duke in january that's right. a little bit odd there but uh, i walked on campus and went to the navy rotc unit right away and just kind of wanted to find out what was available in Navy ROTC. And their, their freshman class conflicted with my calculus class. Well, Air Force ROTC was one floor up. So I just walked up the stairs to the next ROTC unit and started talking to them. And I was really welcome there uh, from the outset. And there was no conflict in the classes, so I started. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I I remember being the new kid on the block, you know, all the other freshmen had already been there for uh, a whole semester. And I was, I was uh, new and trying to figure my way around. And I remember having to be counseled to cut my hair, I think three weeks in a row, because each time I did it wasn't enough. So I don't have that problem these days. Yeah, you, you and me both. Yeah. Um, so you, I didn't realize that, that that's, I, I'm sure I knew this at the time, but I've forgotten it. And so thanks for the yeah. refresher, but um, you know, I, I, in my case, I mean, my dad was certainly a strong proponent of considering it because he looked at it as a, you know, great economic deal to, you know, get a full scholarship and, you know, do the four years in the military. So anyway, different paths. Um, yeah. I knew you were working on your pilot's license. I think we were seniors at that point. Um, you used to drive me crazy on Saturday mornings because you'd want to get up early to study before you took your pilot's lesson for the day. And you did the snooze alarm 15 times. Yeah. Um, so I got up early on Saturday mornings, whether I wanted to or not. Did did um, doing the pilot training before help you when you actually got into Air Force pilot training? Two phases there. Yeah, it helped a lot, I think. Uh, the first phase in ROTC, you had to go through what was called a flight screening program, and that was in the summer of your sophomore year. And that was done on a uh, Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I did prior to going to that screening program was I went and paid for my own lessons. Um, I, that wasn't enough to get my pilot's license by that time, but it was enough to get me through solo. And that was a really big confidence builder to go through lessons in a Cessna 172 up to the point of solo so that when I went to the Air Force screening program, it wasn't all new to me. And so that was a, a huge confidence builder and I think uh, a high contributor to me successfully making it through the screening program. Um, and then from sophomore summer through graduation, I took that opportunity to after having about 10 to 20 hours of flight time and applying it towards the license, which can you can get about 40 hours of flight time. Right. So I went ahead and, and finished up the lessons and I wanted to get that done before Air Force pilot training started for a see if that confidence boost worked again maybe mm -hmm. i'd gain the extra knowledge needed and uh i knew that when i started flying with the air force that i probably wouldn't be able to follow through on that license bit so i wanted to get that done uh before my attention got diverted from it so that was the thrust and kind of getting it done before 
graduating. Um, did that have an impact on pilot training? Not as much, I think, as the flight screening program, because the mm -hmm. pilot training is really, they break everybody down to the same pulp and then build everybody up. Yeah. Um, so the people, there are some people who actually struggle in Air Force pilot training who had their licenses. If they had, their li if they had been flying civilian for a, a while, they could have picked mm -hmm. up some bad habits. And that might not have translated well to what the Air Force flight training was trying to do. So I had just enough to boost my confidence, not enough to build bad habits. And it, it helped in that way. So to so walk through the, the progression of training that you go through when you decide to be an Air Force pilot and sort of length and types of things that you're doing along the way. Air Force pilot training, when I went through, is about a year-long process, and there's two phases. Uh, the first phase was in the T-37, um, and the second phase was in the T-38. The T-37 was a small, unpressurized, twin-engine jet trainer, um, and it was aerobatic. So uh, you would learn initially how to land the airplane, how to do normal procedures, how to do emergency procedures. And then you'd roll into learning how to do some aerobatics. And then you would learn in, uh, how to do instrument flying. And then towards the end, you would get some introduction to formation flying. Yeah. Um, that particular phase, uh, once you complete that, then you go on to the T-38. So the T-38 is a uh, heavier pressurized jet trainer and it's supersonic also. So at that point in time, uh, the Air Force is trying to train you to be universally assignable into any airplane that they have at that point in time. It's a pretty challenging airplane to fly, which is good in that if you graduate Air Force pilot training in a T-38, the likelihood of you being able to fly any follow-on airplane is high. And then your concentration is more on how to employ that airplane in the mission that the assignment is. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't want a fighter airplane to be so hard to fly that you can't concentrate on fighting the enemy or employing mm -hmm. the weapons. And, and that concept would apply towards any airplane. You know, you know, if you can, uh, if you can get the flying through the T-38 phase, you knew you could fly any other airplane basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that was the second half of pilot training. All told it was about 200 flight hours mm -hmm. uh, between the two airplanes. And in the T-38, you got more instrument flying, more formation flying, and uh, and you got more skilled at it all because it's a more difficult airplane. You, you got to think faster because it's going a lot faster in speed. When you were doing pilot training, um, what portion of people ended up washing out? Uh, my recollection is uh, we, I think, started out with about 25 people in my class and graduated with about 20. Yeah. So some are about uh, you know 25% of the people yeah. washed out. I'd say half of that was self-initiated and the other half was probably performance related. I think you do get into pilot training and start it. And sometimes you just don't have a good idea what it is. And throughout that year, uh, it's okay for you to figure out that this is not what's right for me. Yeah. And I think everybody wants that. You know, if you don't, if you don't think you're a good fit, then, um, you know, then you can stop training and go on to something else. There was, a period of time where if you went to the Air Force Academy you and you had the medical qualifications to be a pilot, you were expected to go to pilot training. And mm -hmm. you actually had to go see the commandant to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of people who ended up going to pilot training where it really wasn't their interest. And then they mm -hmm. might they might uh, leave at that point in time. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, the people at the Air Force Academy have to compete for a flying slot like we did in ROTC. But uh, so it's now I think there's more interest in succeeding than perhaps before because you had to compete for your your slot to get there in the first place. Yeah. I mean, certainly there were a lot of people at the base I was at, which is outside of Boston, where we did not have any planes at that base. And one right. of the jokes used to be that people who had bailed out of pilot training liked to go there because they didn't have a bunch of planes around to remind them that that, you know, that, that could be out. it. That could be yeah. it. So you finish the T-38 training and then, you know, then they start trying to specialize you based on sort of, you know, what they've seen and where did you, what did you do next after that? So I went to the KC-135, uh, which is an air refueling tanker. And our mission was to um, basically refuel other airplanes in flight. At the time, Strategic Air Command existed and all the KC-135s were essentially assigned to Strategic Air Command. So they were on alert for the nuclear mission right. uh, so that if the uh, siren went off, uh, the 
the tankers and the bombers would all lift off from their various bases and then they would uh, meet up in midair the tankers would give their gas to the bombers and the bombers would go on their way and be part of the nuclear triad so but we would also be used to refuel fighter airplanes and cargo airplanes and the like but we were assigned a strategic air command primarily for that uh, uh, that nuclear um, that nuclear deterrent mission around 1992 strategic air command was uh, um, dissolved and all of the assets were absorbed into either air mobility command or air combat command and all the tankers basically went to mobility command and started to behave more like an airlifter than they than they were like a strategic deterrent asset at that time is when I moved over to Europe. So my assignment was uh, was over to the uh, U.S. Air Forces in Europe. So we were aligned more or less with refueling the fighter airplanes that were stationed up there as well. So there was a base right next to ours that housed F-111s and F-15s. Um, and then there were a lot of F-16s over in Germany and Italy that we would refuel. And we would get to do a lot of refueling of uh, NATO aircraft forces as well as long yeah. as they had a compatible airplane. So Norway had F-16s and we would refuel them a bunch. And, and sometimes we would do the probe and drogue configuration on the airplane and we could refuel uh, British airplanes or German air, aircraft. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the, the assignment in Europe was, was great for that. Yeah. Um, for doing more than just the United States support. Yeah. I, I got to go up once in a tanker. I don't know if you did too. This is when we were we were at Duke um, in our OPC. It was they took us out to was the base out in North, you know, further out in North Carolina. Seymour Johnson. Yep. Seymour Johnson. Yeah. So we, you know, we we went out to Seymour Johnson, got to go up in a tanker, got to sit down in, you know, the belly of the plane next to the, you know, the guy who was controlling the boom. It was a pretty cool experience. And it, and it you know, certainly you, you, seeing it firsthand, you appreciate that it requires a lot of precision from both pilots. Um, I, you're probably biased, but who do you think has the harder job, the tanker pilot um, or the, the the plane being refueled in terms of that that connection yeah. goes on? The, re them? the receiver pilot has the harder job for sure. And they, they're the ones who have to match the speed, match the altitude, things like that. The tanker pilot's job is to be as stable as possible. And they're usually doing that on an autopilot. So it's yeah. really not that hard. Uh, when the autopilot breaks, uh, that's when you have to shine with your skills a little bit. So we practice that and we make sure that we can do it uh, in case the autopilot doesn't work. But it, in general, the autopilot is a better option for uh, making a stable platform for the receiver pilot. It's definitely yeah. harder for them. Yeah. And then, you know, you sort of went through your progression of roles earlier. You know, so ultimately you end up getting accepted into test pilot school or the test pilot program within the Air Force. Um, and you're out at Vandenberg, right? In California, am I remembering this right? Uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Edwards. Van Sorry. Vandenberg does the uh, missile launches. But okay. So you're out at Edwards. What were the kinds of things that you were doing when you were in your test pilot days with the Air Force? So at Edwards, um, the first job I was assigned was uh, to essentially run the... Uh, tanker testing program. So any new receiver airplane uh, needs to get qualified in refueling behind the existing tankers. So we had a tanker airplane at Edwards that was instrumented with uh, loads and fuel flows. Um, and we would use that airplane in concert with a, a new receiver that needed to get qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and the airplane at the time that was under test was the F-22. Mm -hmm. So we were the... Um, first ones to refuel the F-22. So I, I uh, greatly remember that experience well, because uh, in in your general tanker job, you don't really get to know the receiver pilots very well at all. But it, since you're all combined there at the, at the test wing at Edwards, you get to know uh, everybody a little bit Friday night at the club kind of thing. And, uh, and so the F-22 test pilot who did the very first hookup Steve Rainey, I still you know remember his name to this day because of how well of a connection we had as a test team. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first thing that I did as a test pilot at Edwards was basically the air refueling certification aspects and the the major player at the time was the F-22. And we did that in other realms when the um, F-35 had a fly off, they had the X-32 and the X-35. We were the ones right. to do the refueling of those two airplanes. So that was kind of fun. Um, I also got checked out in the C9 
Mm -hmm. uh, which was going through some avionics upgrades. They went through an engine hush kit upgrade. They went through some uh, airspace qualifications called reduced vertical separation. And uh, we had to qualify the altimetry system to a tighter standard. And so I did all that with the C9 for about two years. Um, and I also got checked out in the C17 for the last two years of my assignment there. And so we would do a variety of testing in the C17. You would be doing airdrop testing, personnel Mm -hmm. uh, drop testing. We were testing um, increased capability of engines. We were testing formation station keeping systems because the, the fleet had found some issues with them after they got fielded. So we were getting new software updates to those systems and we were having to create the scenarios of multiple airplanes and how they would fly in, in formation together. Uh, for their missions. So uh, quite a bit of variety of, of testing that I did in my first assignment. And then the second assignment of uh, flight test was more on the management side of things. So I ended up for the first year back, I was on test pilot school staff. So I was instructing the, the TPS students in the large aircraft flying mm -hmm. test techniques, and then um, ended up getting to be a squadron commander of a uh, small unit. And that that small unit had a single KC-135 assigned to it, and it was um, a avionics test bed, essentially a communications test bed. And it would also fly distinguished visitors around the world because it was outfitted very well with a, a, a nice cabin. And so if, um, if we had some communications or avionics testing that, uh, that was good for flying around the world, we could also put a four-star uh, Air Force officer on board and take them where they needed to go for for their mission of of uh, you know completing the senior leader Air Force objectives and that could have been anywhere in the world so that was unique to get back into the worldwide flying for the yeah. last couple of years of my career there yeah um, and then the last two years of my final assignment in the Air Force I worked at the op operations group level as the deputy and we had uh, you know an a uh, 06 colonel as a commander and a couple lieutenant colonels as deputies, but uh, we had a lot going on. We had seven flying squadrons, an operational support squadron, you know, a dozen runways and lake beds to worry about. So there was a lot going on, and we needed uh, we needed people to help manage that. So that was what I did for the last couple of years. Yeah. So in the 21 years you were in, what what when you look back, what what, what were your favorite years? What were your favorite parts? Uh, location wise, it was England. Uh, four years in England was a, a unique thing. Number one, it was a brand new squadron. So the people all showed up at the same time. So you typically in a military assignment, you come in and leave somewhere in about a three year rotation. So at any one time, a third year people are always rotating out. This squadron was unique in that everybody showed up to stand it up from the beginning and we were together for the first three years, basically. And then people started rotating out. So it was really unique to get to know people at a deeper level at that assignment because you were there together longer and and uh, did some pretty unique flying at the time. So England was my best location. It's also where I met my wife. So that you know we both have memories from that. So that uh, that, that weighs uh, very strongly on our hearts. Flying wise, it was probably test pilot school and the flight test activity afterwards. In test pilot school, I got to fly like thirty five different airplanes wow. in a year. Um, not you're not qualified in all of them. Um, you're qualified maybe in about three or four of them throughout the year to go fly on on your solo aspect of things. But mm -hmm. you're in, with an instructor on the others. But they exposed you to a variety of airplanes. So that's where I got to fly some fighters. I got to fly some cargo airplanes. I got to fly old Warbird type uh, yeah. airplane. I got to fly a MiG-17. So th there were some exciting things going on during test pilot school, and then that just gave you a flavor of how airplanes flew. Uh, old, new, big, yeah. small, fast, slow, uh, so that when you're out there testing your airplane later, you have a frame of reference that is uh, a much broader perspective than you might have on a normal operational pilot assignment path. Yeah. H how did uh, your time in the military shape your views in terms of leadership? What I think I found was, you know, you had formal leadership positions, and then mm -hmm. you had informal leadership is where most of the work got done was in the informal leadership side of things. Military structure, you've got those formal hierarchy and you've got uh, designations in front of your name, whether it's uh, lieutenant or captain or sergeant or whatever, you know, you have, you have those um, 
positions of authority, but most of the work gets done through um, figuring out those relationships um, with different organizations and different people, and then how to get that informal group of people to have the same objective and to, to go help you get your mission done. So you're working in an informal way. Uh, easy example might be in a crew of four on a KC-135, if I was the co-pilot, I'm not the leader of that airplane, uh, but I do have a voice. And so how do I influence the outcome of that flight is I've got to feel uh, welcome enough to speak up. I've got to you know, have a crew that's going to listen to me. So therefore, I've got to I've got to be in a position where they trust what I have to say, and that comes through, you know, becoming a professional at what you're doing, uh, having discipline, having integrity, being a, a subject matter expert in what you're uh, supposed to be working on. Once you 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 get all that, then you kind of have some informal authority to help influence something. So what I found throughout 21 years is I wasn't always assigned a formal leadership position where I was. Mm -hmm. um, barking orders, you know, so to speak, I, most of the time I was working in a team and yeah. in that team, I wasn't necessarily always the leader, but you always had the opportunity to shape the outcome of the, of the team through informal leadership and whatnot. So, and yeah. the times that I did have formal leadership positions, I think what I learned most from them was, uh, my job wasn't to bark orders, but it was actually to break down barriers for them uh, so that the rest of the team could be successful. So you, you really learned how to serve a larger community when you're a formal leader um, and, and you're you're given a, a group of people to be responsible for. Um, that's a huge weight on your shoulders and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to raise my hand and to stand up and take on those challenges when I could. Yeah. Um, I think I learned a lot. It helped me be a better informal leader later on in life when I'm, I wasn't uh, assigned those uh, leadership roles anymore. But you know, I'm back to being an aircraft commander of four people, you know, or yeah. something like that. So, yeah. um, in general, I think you know the the military teaches you a lot about leadership and then gives you opportunity to apply it on on a day to day basis. And I think most of the people in the military do you know learn how to become informal leaders. Um, because very few of us actually get to become formal leaders. Right. I, I know you've got to go in a, in a minute, Greg, but just briefly, you know, what, what's ahead for you? What are you, what are you thinking about sort of in your, you know, post NASA days? Yeah. Um, post NASA days, I think uh, what I've, what I've learned about in trying to get ready for, uh, you know, the, this uh, next phase, which, you know, ultimately includes retirement is that, I need to come up with something to retire to, not mm -hmm. retire from. So uh, as I uh, as I execute probably like the last five years of my NASA time is I'm trying to branch out and learn new things um, mm -hmm. so that uh, if I'm retired and say no longer earning an income, I still want to be interested in aviation somehow. So mm -hmm. a couple things catch my attention. Um, one might be something like Civil Air Patrol you know, where you can just donate your time and be a pilot inside Civil Air Patrol. Um, another thing that I found um, a connection to was uh, humanitarian airlift through a charity. And that kind of parlays back to some of the satisfaction I got in the military when I was flying the KC-135. We got to participate in some of these disasters that occurred, uh, whether it was a wartime disaster or a natural disaster, we would we would often do humanitarian support to that. And that was always a rewarding mission to do uh, when you're delivering supplies or when you're delivering fuel to somebody else who's delivering supplies. It was always a rewarding mission. So I found that uh, my background flying the DC-8 for NASA uh, matched up well with an organization that does international disaster relief on, a, on the other DC-8 that operates in the United States. And so I've been able to uh, connect with them and help them out a little bit. And that's been rewarding. So I'm looking forward to when I'm done flying with NASA, having something to retire to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to think about it. Something we could certainly spend a lot more time on than we're going to have today, sort of having that glide path into what you want to do and not just sort yep. of all of a sudden shocking the system and having to figure out what next then. Yeah. Glide path is a term I use often as opposed to a step function. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. All right. I know you got to run. It's been great catching up, looking forward to seeing you and the family this summer and, uh, you know, having you uh, over here in London. So uh, appreciate the time today. And, you know, thanks for kind of, you know, going deep on 
the world of being a test pilot. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, JR. I uh, hope that it helps somebody out there. Uh, and um, I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed catching up and talking to you. So yeah, appreciate right. it. Yep. Take care, Greg. It was great catching up with Greg today and hearing uh, what it's like to be a NASA test pilot uh, and also one in the Air Force and a bit about his broader military career as well. If you're ready to take control of your career, visit pathwise.io. If you'd like more regular career insights, you can become a Pathwise member. It's free. You can also sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at Pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.